and welcome to the 25th edition of Archive Thrifting. And what better way to celebrate number 25 than with a special on the road edition? Or I was already out of state working on the whole AM stereo thing and this was just pure coincidence that this was number 25. Anyway, we're kicking things off in Fairmont today, and uh, I'll let my past self fill you in once we arrive downtown. I'm kind of retracing my steps to a point from last year, if you remember the one I did. And uh, once again, we are in Fairmont, Minnesota, and I'm going to head into 12 baskets here. And allegedly there's a Salvation Army just up the street, but I think I'll just walk that. So, yeah, let's see if all goes well. Oh, well, the uh, internet didn't discern what it was. Actually, it did say thrift store, but uh, yeah, I don't think so. So, uh, 12 baskets it is. Just a heads up, the store was swinging on a Monday afternoon, no less, so I had to really slow down most of the footage. Anyway, Sonny and Cher's first effort, which was actually a compilation album with three other artists, and, uh, looks like someone carved a potato to look like Johnny Cash. Underneath that was one of the umpteen repackagings of Elvis Presley's religious output. Then, uh, there's more than Johnny Cash I know. Otherwise, two out of the four solo albums released simultaneously by the members of KISS at 15 bucks a pop. No way, Jose. Oh yeah, and more Johnny Cash. Otherwise, I found one of those infamous Madison 10 VHS box sets, and this one's all about the Mafia. And there's just not enough hours in the day for me to undertake something like that. Aside from that, I cherry-picked a stack of eight tracks for us to look at, up top, it may or may not be a record ripoffs candidate, I can't really tell, The Beach Boys in Concert from 1973. Now, uh, there's a name I haven't seen in a while now, The Normandies, as first heard in one of the early record ripoffs episodes. Below that, uh, I've already got that one on CD, Andy Gibbs' first album, which was a pleasant surprise, uh, actually much more singer-songwriter and country rock than disco. Then we have something called Party Time Etc., which is better known as Laughing with Jeb and Cousin Easy. Below that is what I'm 99.9% .9 convinced is a truck stop bootleg of Gilbert O'Sullivan's first album. I didn't know he played guitar, or bore such a striking resemblance to Peter Noon. And at the bottom, a possible R&B record ripoffs candidate. And uh, these so-called charm tapes, uh, made by Magnetic, what became Magnetic Video, are sometimes the real deal, sometimes knockoffs. You never really know till you pop it in. For a minute there, I thought I found a couple of the old Sports Illustrated football phones, but uh, nope, just really small crockpots. Beside that is a uh, truly stylish microwave oven and they only wanted 50 cents for it. But I'm still not getting it. In their ever-cluttered electronics section, I found the box for seemingly a CB or ham radio microphone, and that seemed to be the thing for most of that shelf. Otherwise, below that, an AM-FM cassette car radio. No idea if it's AM stereo equipped, though. Not that it matters. Otherwise, uh, under saran wrap, a VHS rewinder, but just that one way. I've already got a couple of the two-way ones. A cute little mini stereo and a fairly decent Panasonic VHS deck, but uh, I'll leave those for someone else. Now, this caught my attention, a Sears Dual 8. This is a Combo 8 and Super 8 millimeter viewer and editor. These are handy for taking a quick look at films, uh, and of course splicing if you need it. It seems to work. Everything lit up and the motor works, and uh, I'm not carrying any tools to open it up and see what bulb it uses, but uh, yeah, it looks okay. On that note, uh, a little PTSD trigger for me. One of those black box telescenes, and that one's got sound. And I refuse to touch one of those things ever again. 
Otherwise, rather amusingly, a humidifier. I think a dehumidifier is more useful around these parts. But anyway, always gotta check out reel-to-reel decks when I find them. This is one of the later Webcore Regent Coronet decks, probably from the 1962 to 65 range, and I think one of the few four track decks they made. These are noteworthy in that they can record at three speeds, not just the usual two. Conversely, these were pretty low end units, not very reliable, tube driven, and of course, those can be a bear to replace at this point. I'd really only ever use this as a moldy tape cleaning rig at this point, and I've already got one of those. And the haul from this store consists of a 45 of Black Sabbath's Iron Man, and cut down from 6 minutes to 3 and a half. That can't end well. Otherwise, five eight tracks, all but one being archive candidates. We've got, despite the cover, Laughing with Jeb and Cousin Easy, which is a PG-rated adult party album sort of deal. We got three record ripoffs candidates and the Beach Boys in Concert. Found off camera, we've got a pair of passive speakers and a cheapy disc man, both still new and no more than $1.50 a piece. I can always use spares. And of course, the Sears Do All 8 Editor Viewer. Well, it's late enough that the only thrift store still open right now is the Goodwill, so the others will have to go on the back burner until tomorrow. Thanks, past Benny Boy. Anyway, we're in Mankato now, later the same day, and I'm greeted with a McDonald's McFlurry maker, which at one point had powder mix. Or you know what? I could just go to Dairy Queen and get a blizzard. Oh, this looks horrendous. And they wanted nine bucks for it. Found the trifecta of 90s goodness. Charles and Eddie's Duophonic, of which Would I Lie to You is one of Sergei's favorites. But uh, yeah, I can't seem to find their second album anywhere. Probably because it sold like five copies. Anyway, The Gin Blossoms, New Miserable Experience, and The Spin Doctors, Pocket Full of Kryptonite, the latter of which I don't have, and I'm not sure I really want this, and don't let that case fool you, it was actually a bit scratched. Otherwise, we've got the original configuration of James Taylor's Christmas album. Why he did an album of overdone covers and not originals is beyond me. But to otherwise, I guess we're close enough to Canada for this. Alana Miles' first album. I don't know, do I need some black velvet in my life? Oh, why not? One dollar and in pristine condition. I feel like I just did these tapes in the last thrifting episode. The Carpenters' self-titled album in its U.S. configuration this time. Then another Chrysalis Pat Benatar album, which I've already got on CD, and that tape is probably sticky anyway. And like most of her hit albums, it's about half a good record. Now, I've seen this double Supremes compilation on vinyl many times, but never on cassette. But I've already got their box set. Now, I almost never see Rounder Records albums on cassette, but uh, there you go. George Thorogood's, uh, I think, second album. The self-titled Genesis album, which I won't deny has a great first side. Side 2 is woefully uneven, though. Anyway, I got some black velvet in my life. Do I need some Rico Suave, too? No, not really. And it wouldn't be thrifting in Minnesota without some weird self-recorded thing, so here's Erwin Seuss, Volume 13, from right here in Mankato. And Volume 13 is not a joke. The J-Card even touts Volumes 1 through 12. In the VHS, I found what I thought might have been some European PAL tapes that somehow found their way over here, but uh, these look a little dodgy. I'm thinking these might be bootlegs. Uh, the tape labels definitely don't look BBC official. Best of. Just best of. 
And, uh, oh dear, I'm getting some serious Easy Riders vibes from this. It looks like one of those Bikers and Babes kind of tapes. Yep. I'm still trying to recover the brain cells I lost the last time I did any of that Easy Riders stuff. In the electronics, it's a graveyard for DVD players. And it looks like out of all of those, not one of them has any unique features to it. Good lord, this is as depressing as the electronic sections back home. And the modest haul from this store consists of Erwin Seuss, another amateur polka album. I guess that's just a thing in Minnesota. And I guess I'm obligated to find the other 12 volumes now, aren't I? And yeah, I got me a little black velvet in my life now, too. Well, I guess you could call this a mini thrift. I tend to hit Barnes & Noble for the $5 CDs, and I actually did pick up a couple. Believe it or not, Floydian that I am, I never have done Roger Waters, the pros and cons of hitchhiking. And I have as much of a Dylan disciple as I am. I've never done Infidels, and I've loved Joker Man forever. So yeah, I kind of push in the definition of thrift, but eh. Picking up the next morning at the Salvation Army Family Store. I actually went here last year, but had no luck whatsoever. I didn't even shoot any footage. So here's hoping we do better the second time around. In the CDs, Dion's Deja New Album from 2000, some of whose tracks had already been on another album of his years earlier, but it's one of those deals where the label went under like five minutes after it came out. But anyway, I love the cuts from it that appeared on his actually really good box set, so yeah, I'll buy it for a dollar. Anyway, this was one of the radio staples when I was in early middle school, but uh, I don't think I've heard Sonny came home on the radio since then, though. Otherwise, a little selection of eight tracks... So we got a uh, really skimpy Hullies compilation. Only about 25 minutes. Otherwise, there was some Sea level Joe South, one of Randy Meisner's two self-titled albums. Stuff I'd gladly take on CD, but yeah, I don't want to put up with the eight tracks. Richie Fure, Rod Stewart already got that. In the VHS... I had this very issue of the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie as a kid, and the only way I'd pick this up now is if it had all the Pizza Hut stuff that came with it at the time, and it ain't there. Then we've got uh, what I believe to be the first VHS issue of Beverly Hills Cop, issued in about 1985. I don't know, that's more of a Betamax kind of movie to me. Otherwise, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which I also had and have on DVD these days. A few tapes over, we've got a uh, Deek special that I have no recollection of whatsoever. And uh, man, this looks bad. And it looks like something that the YouTube bots would give me hell over if I tried to cover it on Archive. Ah yes, back when they were trying to market Gremlins as a kid's thing. I found what I think is the full set of book and record packages at $3.50 a piece. They're intact, they look really nice, and I'd much rather see it go to someone who would appreciate it more than I would. For the record, I love Gremlins. I think it's a great movie. But uh, yeah, this is Archive. We gotta look at crap. So I found me two copies, one still sealed, of another Minnesota polka album, this time from Jerry Minar, Minar. If I read the liner notes correctly, this appears to be some sort of effective promotional item for a particular brand of concertina. Anyway, I love this movie, Nashville, from 1975. Already got this soundtrack on CD, and for the most part, it just doesn't play well outside of the movie. 
In the electronics, a photo phone, for your functionally illiterate and or dementia-ridden grandparent, I guess. Otherwise, uh, I haven't seen Mad Cats anything in some time, but uh, yeah, there's a steering wheel set to use with your Sony PlayStation. And I do have a PlayStation, but no racing games and no desire to try and store that thing. Anyway, we've got uh, what I'm sure is a totally dim and pixel-rific Epson projector. And uh, yeah, I do see the weather radio in the background. I've already got the top of the line Midland at home. But uh, yeah, not much shaken here. I love it when thrift stores give me repurposed bags. And funnily enough, I wound up doing Red Lobster that night. Power of suggestion, I guess. Anyway, the haul from this store consists of Jerry Minar Minar and his friends and his concertina found off camera some VHS tutorial thing called Radiant Pearls. And I was getting some serious magical rainbow sponge vibes from that. Uh, found footage fest fans will get it. Also found off camera, Al Jarreau's Breaking Away, a little early 80s yacht rock goodness, you know. And of course, Dion's Deja Nu. One last store before we leave Mankato, Neighborhood Thrift Store, which I spotted on the way into town, so it seemed appropriate to make it the last stop on the way back out. On top of the cassette display were two blank VHS tapes, one still sealed, but it was actually the open one that piqued my interest. This is the earliest blockbuster video blank I've ever encountered, early 90s. No idea if anything is already on it, I'm kind of hoping there's something on it, but uh, yeah, at 75 cents it seemed worth it, uh, if only for the good condition and for what it is. The front of the store was just swinging, so I brought my electronics finds to the back just for a little piece. Anyway, I found two DVD recorders. This first one is a Funai, a brand I'm really not fond of at all. They made the last VHS decks, and those things were total junk. I can't imagine this is much better. Here's the other one, a Magnavox, and a slimmed down version of a Magnavox DVD recorder I already have, and have the remote for. Now, it's getting to the point where I just dread the two recorders that I have at home breaking down on me, so yeah, I was very interested. And I tested it as much as possible, unfortunately there were no monitors around to hook it up to, but everything seemed to work. And as it turned out, the entire front area of the store was half off that day, so that brought the price down to 8 bucks, and uh, yeah, of course I took the gamble. And the semi-modest haul from this store consists of the Blockbuster Video Possibly Blank Tape. I haven't popped it in to check yet. Now, these are rebadged Sony tapes. They're perfectly decent tapes, it's just the packaging looks kind of cheap. And uh, yeah, of course, I also picked up that Magnavox DVD recorder. In St. Cloud now, or wait, park, close enough. And yes, it's the next morning. And I have it on good authority that this store will not open until this 12 and a half minute Pink Floyd track finishes. Well, once the Floyd track finished, I headed in and was greeted by a 16mm projector. Yes, it talked to me. The mushrooms probably helped. Anyway, I'm still kinda in the market for a 16mm projector, but I kinda know what I want too. A later model uses halogen bulbs, probably an Elmo. This, on the other hand, is probably the oldest 16mm I've seen in the wild, made by RCA, probably from the 50s, and pretty dirty and rusty. If nothing else, for what it is, the price was about right. Oh dear. My mom had some speakers and associated wireless headphones like this for her stereo when I was growing up. These things are junk. Crappy range, crappy sound, 
tellingly, this looks like it's spent most of its years back in the box. Oh wow, a 1930s radio with an FM tuner, a cassette deck, and CD player? Or is this one of those crappy post-2000 Crosley deals? Anyway, I am in the market for a narrow subwoofer for my pseudo-home theater, but I've made my mind up that I want a decent standalone one, not me cannibalizing part of another set of speakers. And uh, they had the main left and right speakers up on the top shelf there. Now, over here, we've got what may very well be the receiver for those speakers. And it's pretty basic. Basically, just a CD player and an iPod dock. If this had an HD radio tuner in it, I'd consider it, but that doesn't appear to be a thing here. Anyway, down at the bottom, another kind of microsystem. This time, a DVD player with DVD RAM capability. Something I've already got at home. In fact, there's nothing about this system I don't already have. Want to guarantee that I will never buy vinyl at your thrift store? Overprice it and only have the same old junk that I could get for a dollar or less almost anywhere else. And on to today's last store. And yes, these have all been presented chronologically. Anyway, I had some luck here last year. Let's see if lightning can't strike twice. Well, in the last thrifting episode, I got shafted out of a copy of Twister's Fury on the Plains. I guess this'll have to function as something of a consolation prize. Twister's Nature's Fury from 1997 or so. Now, I have since seen Fury online, and I think I nicknamed almost everyone in that thing Cletus. Anyway, the Lalonde brothers strike again. Another one of their weird evangelical apocalyptic tales, titled Apocalypse, no less. Yeah, I'm only tackling this one if the Rift Tracks guys do it. I refuse to take that one straight. Anyway, another Roger Rabbit sighting, this time tied to Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and I used to rent this just for tummy trouble. I'm still holding out for the Laserdisc compilation of the standalone Roger Rabbit cartoons. I don't need this. I already have other means of playing and transferring microcassettes, oh, but it's got a foot switch and very speed. And it was just as well, it was dead. I think some secretary rammed it right into the ground. Now that is one sexy beast. An NEC DS-8000U SVHS deck from about 1989. And this thing looks like it's got a few toys to it. Oh man, this looks almost like a full-fledged editing deck. And I can't confirm it, but I've heard that these things can do linear, linear, for our more pretentious viewers, stereo. Something I've been after for some time now. But anyway, 15 bucks, fair enough. Let's test this sucker out. So I got me a sacrificial tape to test with, and there's already something in there. Well, let's find out what it is, shall we? If it'll eject. Hello? How about fast forward? Play anything? Well, it probably wouldn't hurt to turn the damn thing on first, would it? But anyway, uh, yeah, it, it makes noises. Lots of noises. And then it just shuts itself off. Well, that could mean something as minor as a dirty sensor or bad rubber, all the way up to a fried circuit board. Curses foiled again. I find it quite comforting to see a CRT TV in the wild again. I already have four at home, so yeah, I'll leave that for someone else. But uh, the price was okay, $10.49. And uh, I'm known to snag cassette caddies, but these seemed a little pricey at seven bucks and kind of heavy, and I found out why. It's someone's mostly Christian pop collection. And as for the second one I found, 
it was home to lots and lots of dubs. And the only semi-interesting looking one in there was labeled Xmas Comedy, which looks like a bunch of stuff that I've already got. I'll let you take a quick look at the track list here. Mentioned these earlier already. This is a VHS Rewind Fast Forward unit. And even though I've already got two, I'm kind of kicking myself for not picking this up for, you know, a third. Otherwise, I found part of a Radio Shack VCR rabbit. Now, I've never owned a Sega Dreamcast, so this seemed unique at first. Then I realized it's a perfectly standard RF modulator. There is nothing unique to the Dreamcast here. Marketing at its finest. And the haul from this store consists of Twisters, Nature's Fury on VHS. And yeah, of course I picked up the SVHS deck. The shipping alone on Fleabay on another one would be far more. I've resurrected VCRs before. Hopefully I can do it again with this one, because this is a nice, kind of prosumer deck. And the possibly record-breaking final haul from this 25th thrifting expedition consists of the Sears Do-All 8 editor viewer thing, two records, a 45 from Black Sabbath, picked up by virtue of it being a Black Sabbath 45, and Jerry Minar, Minar, and friends, a whole lot of concertina going on. We've got the NEC SVHS deck, currently in the for repair pile. We've got a spare pair of passive speakers and a spare off-brand Discman, both still sealed. We've got the slimmed down Magnavox DVD recorder, which I admittedly haven't fully tested yet. We've got five CDs from Alana Miles, Bob Dylan, Roger Waters, Dion, and Al Jarreau. Then we've got three VHS titles, the Twisters tape, a blockbuster video blank, and something called Radiant Pearls. One audio cassette, Erwin Seuss, One Man Band, Volume 13, and I think we'll end with a bit of that today. Then we've got five eight tracks, one from the Beach Boys, and four assorted archive candidates. And the final cost of this haul came out to about... $54. And that's going to be it for this installment of Archive Thrifting. I'll talk to you again soon. Cat, we get often asked so much what type of paper to use. What is your favorite cardstock? My favorite cardstock is a matte paper that's absorbent, and I mostly like to work with colors that range from whites and creams all the way to crafts and dark browns.